Thank you. It was once said that one in every third person is extremely beautiful or outstandingly handsome. If you're online or in the room, look at two other people. If it's not them, it has to be you. Do me a favor and put your hand on your own chest and repeat after me. I know I look good. Point to two other people and say, you look all right, too. You, you look all right. One night, my friend and I were walking down the street when a car crept alongside of us and a man yelled out, hey, N-words, you guys look lost. How about a ride in my trunk? Now, I was torn. I was thinking to myself, that was a very rude way to offer someone a ride. That was my first experience with racism, but it wouldn't be my last. Have you ever been denied an opportunity, overlooked or excluded because of the color of your skin? Maybe it wasn't the color of your skin. Perhaps it was your gender, your sexual orientation, possibly your age, a disability, or simply because you were different. I was speaking at a showcase, and afterward, a white meeting planner walked up to me and said, Curtis, you were the most qualified speaker on the stage today. Imagine the excitement I had on the inside, because I knew the only topic he was there to book for was the one I just delivered on the stage. But the words he said next reminded me of my place in society. He contended, but I can't use you. When I inquired why not, all while pointing his finger in my face, he alleged, the timing for a black speaker is not right. Now, I don't know if he said white or right, but that's beside the point. He went on to hire another white man, not because he thought that man was the most qualified, but because that man was not black. When I traveled the country, I ask people all over to remember a time when they felt when they were excluded from something and how it made them feel. I get the same answers from CEOs to parents to children. I hear things like, it hurt, or it was painful. Researchers at UCLA discovered that mild episodes of exclusion activated two parts of the brain that process the emotional and distressing aspects of physical pain. Social psychologists and organizational behavioralists suggest that exclusion in the workplace is a new form of mistreatment that could have greater implications than harassment. For every employee who feels ignored, I will show you someone who is 27% more likely to voluntarily sever their employment within three years. But before they leave, be careful. The culture and the environment is going to turn toxic. They'll never be satisfied on the job. And those sick days, they're going to be exhausted because they will display more physical and physiological symptoms. <laughs> I get it. We are living through some very challenging times right now. Boardrooms and HR divisions across our nation are being centered around racism, inclusion, and equity. It's a tough conversation, and it will change the dynamic of any room. A living room, a classroom, or a boardroom. But it's something we all know we need to talk about. But very few people are willing to talk about it. It's like going to McDonald's and ordering a Big Mac when you know you need a salad. <laughs> or going to your favorite clothing store and buying the size you want to wear and not the size you actually wear. But if you're going to enhance your corporate DNA, you must have those courageous conversations in the workplace. And while the, while the dialogue is taking place, in terms of your stakeholders, look around the table and see who is not represented, who should be represented, but also see who is overly represented at the table. Your tables, your boards, your managers, your employees, and or your members should resemble your end client, the people who are purchasing your products, your goods, 
and your services. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to read one sentence. And while you are reading that sentence, I want you to count all of the F's that are in that one sentence. Go. Go. All right, how many of you counted one F, two Fs, okay, three Fs, okay, four Fs, all right, five Fs, six Fs, there it is, there were six Fs. Most people forget to count the ofs. It amazes me how we all can look at the same sentence and see something different. But what's more amazing is how we can look at the same people and see something different. This happens because of unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is the unintentional preference of people. We make snap judgments about people, placing them in categories like race, sex, and gender. In fact, I was reading, reading an article in Physiological Science called First Impression, and it said that we made first impressions about people in one-tenth of a second. One-tenth of a second? That could be dangerous. It took me longer than that to pick out a series on Netflix. <laughs> so the question becomes, what do we do about this? I wish we'd stop tiptoeing around this issue of unconscious bias because all of us in here have unconscious biases. It's the way in which we handle the world around us. And until we pull back the covers on our own unconscious biases, we'll never be able to see people for who they really are. But more importantly, we'll never be able to understand who we really are. I was taking a red eye from Fort Lauderdale to Chicago. And we were experiencing some turbulence, but I was okay until the captain came on. Boop! Hello, my name is Susan, and I'm your captain. I said, oh, man, a woman? (laughs) Then I quickly realized that there was nothing wrong with Susan, that there was something wrong with me. The very next week, I was taking another red eye from Fort Lauderdale to Chicago. I wanted to prove to myself how much I had grown in seven days. I had two prayers, one, that we experienced turbulence, and two, that Susan was our captain. 37,000 feet in the air, prayer uh, prayer number one got answered. And I was praying, come on, Susan, come on, Susan. Boop! Hello, my name is Tyrone. I said, oh, man, a brother? See, unconscious biases, they're everywhere. And I do this work for a living, and I discover some that I didn't even know I have. And in my full presentation, I give you four steps on how to eliminate unconscious bias. But I want you to be careful of one unconscious bias known as affinity bias. It affects our hiring and our recruitment process. Managers tend to hire people who look, act, and sound like them. My son Kyle, who's 14 back home, I guess if he's 14 back home, he's 14 here too. (laughs) Anyway, when he was in third grade, he came home and he said, I want to play soccer. We found a team that would take him, and I must admit, the team was terrible. But the coach, the coach was something special. Before he would make a decision, he would ask other coaches. He would then ask the players, and then he would ask the parents. Clover Pop did a study on inclusive decision-making, and they realized that teams made better decisions than individuals, on average, 66% of the time. We signed Kyle up for an all-boys team, but the coach thought it would be a good idea to let girls play on the boys' team. When teams include gender diversity, they make better decisions 80% of the time. Mm. There was an age requirement for Kyle's team. All the players had to be between the third and the fifth grade. Kyle's coach, he didn't stack the team with fifth graders like most of the coaches did. They were evenly split. The best results from Clover Pop's study is 
when teams are allowed to have gender, age, and ethnic diversity, they make better decisions 87% of the time, with 60% greater results, two times faster in half the meeting. See, Kyle's coach, he welcomed different ethnicities. He let children with disabilities not only be on the team, but participate in the game. See, diversity is about who's on the team. Inclusion is about who plays in the game. Our coach, see, he went from being Kyle's coach to being our coach as well. He was all about community. He would throw these parties, and we would all go and eat, play games, and have fun. Proximity was taking place. Kyle was meeting people who were different from him. Stereotypes were being destroyed, and all of us were becoming family. He was on to something. He was building a truly inclusive culture while at the same time protecting his social capital. This is what it meant for my son's team. The last game of the season, they played in the championship, and they won. Can you guess which one my son is? <laughs> what it will mean for you, the more inclusive and diverse your teams are, the more revenue you will generate. Companies in the top quartile in both ethnic and racial diversity have a 35% likelihood of bringing in revenue far beyond the average median, according to McKinsey and company. People ask me all over, Curtis, we like what you say, but we don't know how we can use you. Well, if you want someone who can come in and have these tough conversations in a non-threatening way, I'm your person. And I do understand that companies are, and organizations are on different parts of the journey. Some companies are just now sticking their toe in the water. And with all of the unrest in our country, I have a presentation for you as well. But then there we have some organizations who may be in waist deep already. They've started the conversation. I can help you continue it. But then we have some who are deep swimmers. I, I can accommodate that as well. I want to leave you with this. Diversity is about who's on the team. And inclusion is about who plays After in the game. After years of fetching water and toweling off other people's sweat, Jason was actually in a game. His first shot was a 20-footer from the right baseline. Was it close? Did you almost make I just, it? I just airballed it. <laughs> I'm like, just, dear God, please, let's just get him a basket. His second shot missed, too, but the third was a charm. A three-point no-doubter. And Jason wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. If I wasn't there to witness it, I wouldn't have believed it, you know. You caught fire. I just caught fire. I was hot as a pistol. Jason ended up shooting six three-pointers, one right after the other. He had 20 points total, and each time a shot went in, his teammates and the crowd went a little crazier. His last basket, right at the buzzer, created total mayhem. Because he is autistic, Jason says he's used to feeling different, but never this different. Never this wonderful. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Rochester, New York. Thank you all. Thank you, Holly. I mean, Holly. Thank you, Angela, for having me.